we ready, Michelle? So, first of all, let me welcome you all to the session called China and the West. And let me take this opportunity to thank Professor Juan Carlos Pava and his wonderful team for this tour de force, which is to recreate the atmosphere and the spirit of the Studio Political Forum at the iconic Palace Hotel, this time online. From what I have been able to see so far, this is really the next best thing. Nothing matches the charm of past events, of course, but the organizers were able to develop this time a dynamic that leaves no one indifferent, or to borrow a very well-used expression nowadays, that leaves no one behind, even uh, people who are not very familiar with new technologies like myself. We are all included. So here we are, able to communicate across the world and to meet at this virtual crossroads to approach together this crucial topic for our lives as citizens called new authoritarian challenges to liberal democracy. Previous sessions discussed issues around institutions like the European Union and the Atlantic Alliance, the relations between countries like the UK, Portugal with Europe, approached France and European sovereignty, America at the crossroads to mention just a few. And future sessions will discuss among other topics, challenges ahead for Russia and China, for NATO, for Portugal, for Brazil, Latin America, Lusophone Africa. This is the context where this session, dedicated to reflect upon China and the West, takes a very particular relevance. The focus will be on China and not but primarily, I think, on the West. But the choice of speakers that we are privileged to have with us today may provide by anticipation an inkling of the focus of this session and the following debate. Martin Haller, a sinologist with Charles University in Prague, who is the founder and director of Synopsis, a project that provides analysis of China-related topics in Europe and who has worked for several media assistance organizations in Europe and Asia. So welcome, Martin. Uh, Susan Cork, who has been a skilled expert and practitioner for 15 years in protecting human rights, uh, promoting tolerance, and supporting democratic reform on the ground in Europe and Eurasia. And Xiao Yang, a research scientist who became a full-time human rights activist after the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, who has been working tirelessly in international organizations for the promotion of democracy and human rights, who has published numerous articles on China, human rights, and internet politics. So welcome you, the speakers, who are going to be introduced, not by me, this is not your introduction, this is just about the session, you are going to be introduced by Guilherme Oliveira Martins. But I would like to say a couple of words about Guilherme. Your, our distinguished speakers, you, are going to be introduced by Guilherme Oliveira Martins, the chair of this session, whom I am proud to call my longtime friend. Guilherme has achieved throughout his life so much more that can be put into words in a couple of minutes. We can all read the summary of his professional trajectory in the information provided by the organizers, but I would like to add to it something that is not there. The human qualities that make Guilherme a humanist in a classical and in a modern sense. Uh, Guilherme has written and published extensively on a wide range of subjects like history, political science, philosophy, literature, the arts, and he's always there to lend a hand when needed, to honor a friend, to lend his learning and experience to a variety of cultural and philanthropic organizations. So thank you so much, Guilherme, for being here. And now I give you the floor. Thank you, Luisa. Uh, you are absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's... Uh, a little bit unfair because, uh, uh, sure. well, I'm an old uh, participant of uh, the uh, political forum. Uh, my participation now is uh, number 28, 28. Uh, 
and I must thank uh, uh, João Carlos Pala because uh, he's uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, he has uh, um, a very, very uh, engaged person to, uh, concerning the debate, the, the international debate and about uh, freedom, about liberty. Uh, that's why uh, um, it's very important uh, this panel uh, concerning uh, China and uh, the West. We are speaking about a crucial question in uh, uh, this uh, moment. It's absolutely fundamental to understand uh, the, the historical evolution uh, and uh, we must uh, uh, see West as a pluralistic reality. Uh, and uh, freedom and liberty uh, depends on that uh, perspective. But uh, we know, we know since uh, very many centuries, the importance, the civilizational importance of China. That's why uh, we must understand history and uh, also the dialogue between civilizations, the uh, old dialogue between civilizations, but now political concerns. The political concerns uh, because uh, the world, the peace, uh, the culture of peace uh, in the world depends on this relation. That's why I'm very happy to be here, uh, mainly with uh, Luisa, uh, and with uh, uh, you. That's why I must uh, give the floor to uh, Martin uh, Alla from uh, Charles University, as uh, Luis said already, and you have the floor, thanking uh, because uh, your kind presence. Please, Martin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. So I would, uh, uh, you know, this being essentially the first presentation, uh, I would like to make a few general comments about what I consider important, or, uh, you know, everything is important, but perhaps the most important aspects of the relationship between China and the West. Uh, the relationship between China and the West is uh, asymmetrical in many respects, but I would think that the most consequential asymmetry is or lies in conceptual frameworks in in the way these two large entities china and the west relate to each other uh, the people's republic of china or more specifically the communist party of china has uh, well-developed tactical and strategic concepts uh, towards um, their western counterparts while the west is only now building similar capacity, or it's rather, I should say, it, it is searching for, for similar um, uh, uh, practical concepts of dealing with China. After, it, uh, after its previous framework um, essentially unraveled. So the Western framework that had been dominant for the last two decades in the relationship towards China basically collapsed after being confronted with the naked truth um, about uh, the, the nature of the uh, Chinese system that has been revealed by the current uh, Communist Party leadership. In other words, Xi Jinping and uh, his leadership made it, made it impossible for people to keep ignoring some basic facts about the People's Republic of China. And anybody who is still who still keeps ignoring them uh, simply hasn't been paying attention uh, for the for the last seven years since uh, 2013. In other words, in the last two decades, the Communist Party of China employed a very effective tactic to deal with the West, uh, while the West based its policies on uh, wrong assumptions. I would say. In my in my understanding, the basis of the current crisis between China and the West uh, lies in this basic situation. The, the PRC is intensifying its policies towards the West, 
that uh, have proved effective in the last 20 years. While the West is finally embarking on a correction of its own failed policy towards China. That's how we got where we are now. The, uh, the, the failed Western assumptions about China had essentially been based on misunderstanding or misreading of the political system in the People's Republic of China. Many concluded back in the 80s that the introduction of market reforms in China, the, the famous Kaika Kaifang policy, the policy of uh, reform and openness, would eventually lead to gradual convergence with capitalism and with uh, political liberalization, if not even democratization. So this, this wishful thinking then underlies the formulation of the so-called engagement policy in the United States and similar variations of this policy elsewhere, like the German change food trade policy and others. Now, uh, anybody who has ever attended a lecture in Marxism and Leninism, and I have been through a few, would know that uh, quote unquote convergence and uh, specifically peaceful evolution is an anathema to a good communist, to all the communist parties, and in particular to the Communist Party of China. Uh, German Mao Zedong has uh, penned several articles exactly on the danger of uh, such ideas, uh, the ideas of uh, convergence and peaceful evolution. In reality, the Communist Party of China never really intended to converge. Instead, it dealt with the West uh, very much the same way it has been dealing with uh, non-party elements, both at home and abroad, for almost 100 years now. That is through the United Front work. Uh, the United Front work, uh, which is a concept that is only now being more familiarized with uh, in, in the West, basically means uh, forming ad hoc temporary alliances with less hostile or often just simply more naive non-party elements against the more unfriendly ones. And this uh, simple tactic or on the surface simple tactic won the Communist Party, the civil war in China. And uh, we can say that it has also won the, the, the Communist Party, the first, the Communist Party of China, the first two decades of this century, when it was basically successfully feeding up the globalization and the liberal international order. The United Front approach uh, by the Communist Party of China towards the outside world was mostly ignored by Western policymakers because of their own illusions. And also because the, the, the Communist Party of China was not particularly outspoken about it before uh, uh, the, the current Secretary General Xi Jinping came around in uh, 2002 and 2003. Before this current leadership, the, the foreign ambitions of the CCP followed famous, the famous Deng Xiaoping's maxim, Tao Kuang Yang Kui, that is usually translated as uh, hide your shine, bide your time. Xi Jinping has abandoned this policy for a more muscular one and more open foreign policy because he believed that the time has finally come. And it's exactly this, this, this uh, more open ambition that has um, invited the current backlash from the West. The West finally came to understand or is coming to understand that the, that the, Leninist, that the Leninist nature of the People's Republic of China one-party system has not really changed. It has only been modernized and strengthened by introducing select elements from Western economy and technology. As uh, the Secretary General Xi Jinping has stated on a number of occasions in his uh, so-called new era, the country 
can go back to the original intent or the sin, uh, because it now has at its disposal uh, a much better economic base and also much more efficient technologies, including the most advanced IT technologies. Using these new tools, it can basically implement the, the original intent, the original idea, the original ideals of uh, Marxism, Leninism, or, or in the Chinese form, specifically Maoism, and implement them in a, in a qualitatively new situation. Uh, basically, what he's saying that, uh, you know, things like uh, centralized control of the economy, uh, plant economy, uh, centralized control of the population, all these things that uh, had failed before in other communist parties, in other communist countries, are now possible in China because China finally has the tools that make these formerly unachievable goals possible. And that's where we are. That's where we stand now. You're facing China that ha that has been empowered by engagement, but not changed. After 20 years of failed policies, the the West is much weakened, and China is much strengthened and emboldened. So that's, I think, you know, the the the, the basic of the of the current problem that uh, the outside world uh, is uh, facing with. The People's Republic of China. Now, uh, do I still have a little bit of time? I have. Uh, I uh, didn't follow the, uh, the, the 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 watch. You don't have much time. Just a couple of minutes. But uh, if there is anything that you would like to say to wrap it up, then perfect. Okay, so maybe just a few remarks about, uh, you know, this particular part of the world where, where I live, the, the Central and Eastern Europe, which actually hasn't really followed uh, uh, entirely uh, the, uh, the historical course that I've just described in the past 20 years. So Eastern Europe has uh, had been very slow to jump on the engagement uh, bandwagon mostly because East Europeans having lived through, you know, Leninist systems um, uh, before 1989, were quite skeptical towards uh, normalizing the, the, the Communist Party system in China and believing that it's actually changed and it's quite different from what it was before. So for about a decade, the, you know, this part of the world, Eastern Europe, actually did not follow the engagement mainstream. And ironically, it uh, came to follow it only after the shocks of the of the uh, 2008 financial crisis uh, and the uh, the ensuing other crisis in in Europe, uh, which sort of shook the uh, you know some of the confidence that East Europeans previously had in the Western liberal order. So they they essentially opened the door for the People's Republic of China. Uh, only about a decade ago, and again, ironically, exactly at that point when the attitude towards the outside world, towards China, already started to change. You know, so we again uh, became a little out of sync with uh, with the rest of the world in, in, in the attitude towards the People's Republic of China. So, um, in other words, the uh, the, 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 the relationship between Eastern Europe and China, which was uh, uh, mostly, it's all mostly manifests itself in that uh, famous or infamous 16 plus one or 17 plus one initiative. Uh, it's a little uh, ahistorical, I would say, uh, which uh, 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 has its root in, uh, in, in very specific conditions in this part of the world. I guess I should really, really stop by now and um, I hope that there will you know, we can we can come back to some of these topics in the discussion. Thank you so much. Shall I begin? Yeah. Uh, sorry, so I think that uh, uh, Guillaume forgot that his uh, mic is not on. <laughs> I don't know how to say that to him. Yes. Ah, okay. Sorry, I think uh, it's wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Martin. Your intervention is uh, very, very, um, uh, very important concerning uh, the structural 
uh, problems uh, and the structural elements uh, in China and uh, uh, the weakness uh, in the West. And we must understand this. Um, and that's why we uh, must have uh, a clear conscience of uh, this relationship. Well, uh, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Susan Cork. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, your uh, perspective is also very, very important here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all of you who made this forum possible and inviting me to speak on such an important topic. It's difficult to follow Martin, who is one of the esteemed experts on China. Um, I'm not a China expert. I have focused my career on uh, democracy and Europe and Eurasia. Um, I wanted to focus today on a few areas where Chinese influence presents a fundamental test for the values-based security alliance of Europe, the United States, and NATO. Um, although the US and Europe seem to generally agree that China's rise poses the most significant challenge to the democratic world order, they have over the years lacked agreement over the nature of the risk and how to respond. Now with the pandemic, it has brought the issue to the forefront and, and revealed a range of differences. Until the pandemic, transatlantic policy towards China seldom moved beyond economic influence and its, economic, and its impact on security. Uh, a recent virtual meeting of German and EU leaders with Xi Jinping really accomplished little. This is despite the fact that Germany had planned to have its EU presidency advance a change through trade policy with China. But the investment climate has gotten more difficult. Um, you have the pandemic, the crackdown in Xinjiang, and China's uh, actions in Hong Kong that's sort of changed the playing field. And the US position, despite its uh, engagement policy, um, is in a much more adversarial position uh, towards China, um, even than the EU. But those two positions are getting closer together. Um, for the future of American, EU, and Chinese relationships, relations, um, the final months of this year are shaping up to be a decisive period of time. For the United States facing an election and just a few weeks, I think it's safe to predict that in a Biden presidency, the US and Europe would have an opportunity to develop a more united front against China. Biden um, has long been interested in building alliances. I think if we have a second Trump presidency, the rupture between the US and Europe is likely to continue to grow wider. Um, in the immediate term, so Trump has sought to reframe the November 3rd election around the looming threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. He said, if I don't win the election, China will own the United States. Um, he also said China wants him to lose. I would not say that's exactly so. Um, Trump, with Trump's isolationism and allergy to uh, multilateral alliances, uh, China see, has seen an opportunity and a way to fill that the vacuum posed by this disunity. I think China would be more worried about a Biden presidency. Um, Biden has written about his desire to forge a coalition of countries to isolate China. Um, a quote is when he, he said, when we join together with fellow democracies, our strengths more than double. Um, so I, I think that, you know, under Biden, he will focus much more on China's anti-democratic behavior. Um, he'll likely have a stronger stance against China's infringement of uh, Hong Kong's autonomy and democratic processes. And I expect he will be much more forceful about Beijing's mass detention of Muslims in Xinjiang. Um, moving on, I think the digital realm is an area where a unified US-EU approach is sorely needed. Um, I would go so far as to say that we need a transatlantic digital alliance. Um, Washington with Europe must really uh, get stronger about shaping the rules, norms, and institutions uh, in terms of global use of new technologies and rules of the internet. Otherwise, we know China and Russia are working very hard and in innovating um, to create a digital world that further exacerbates the decline of democracy and the rise of their systems. Um, from what Martin described, I think we can agree that Xi Jinping really does have a vision for the world. 
one that is in direct contradiction and competition with the Western liberal democratic order, what she calls a um, community of shared future for mankind should be understood as a threat. Um, he really does seek to shape a different global order than the post-World War II international human rights system and values-based multilateralism. Uh, Beijing does not want to accept limits on state power and how citizens are treated, um, and they want to reshape norms and practices. I'm gonna now talk a little bit about how that's playing out in a few spheres. And really this is a very complicated topic where a lot more research is needed. I can really only touch the tip of the iceberg, but I, I hope that some of my remarks uh, will encourage all of us to forge some new research and policy partnerships. My speaking on this topic today is an outcome of conversations I had last year at Estriel. Um, so the four areas I wanted to talk a little bit about are, are um, international organizations and alliances, um, China's censorship internally and externally, their influence on your universities and NGOs, um, and their aggressive diplomacy that takes advantage of uh, gaps in Western knowledge. Um, in terms of international organizations and human rights standards, uh, I think Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch said it well when he said, no other government flexes its political muscles with such vigor and determination to undermine the international human rights standards and institutions that ho could hold it to account. Um, so I think we should be clear that China's goal is to weaken the international human rights system. Um, they've been pretty somewhat successful by working within institutions. They haven't been pulling away from those institutions. They've been investing. For example, um, in June, the UN Human Rights Council adopted China's proposed resolution on mutually beneficial cooperation. Um, China's June resolution seeks to reposition human rights law as a matter of state to state relations um, and sees what had been agreed upon universal human rights as something that's subject to negotiation and compromise and it doesn't uh, involve a role for civil society. Uh, in the UN, the Chinese government has also sought to block United Nations measures to protect at-risk populations such as in Syria or in the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya Muslims. Um, so, you know, th there seems to be a trend of, of China working within these organizations and trying to strip their power on human rights standards. Um, another much talked about category is uh, Beijing censorship. It's um, well known for its internal censorship, its so-called Great Firewall. Um, it has aggressively kept Chinese citizens from having access to criticism of the government from abroad. Uh, it has really innovated on tech surveillance, as, as Martin described, um, with video cameras combined with facial recognition technology. Um, it's basically a complete surveillance state. But uh, the new trend is that it's been increasingly attacking critics outside China. Um, during the pandemic, it really increased its use of overt propaganda and disinformation to change the narrative to the one that Beijing wants. Um, Journalists uncovered a wide-ranging Chinese uh, campaign in Eastern Europe aimed at changing the discourse on Hong Kong protests. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, they had a massive PR effort uh, to deflect responsibility for COVID um, and even try to paint itself as the global reader, leader on response. Um, the next, the third category I wanted to talk about is Chinese influence on universities and NGOs. Um, last year, I think Larry Diamond gave a very good talk on, um, you know, the growing and the overwhelming influence of um, Chinese, uh, the Chinese government in American institutions. Um, but, you know, they also, you know, to give an example in Europe and Hungary, they operate four Confucius centers um, and they're, often outside the capital city and often by universities that are cash strapped. So in exchange for self-censorship, they China provides funding. Um, so I think that's another area where we could uh, benefit from a deeper understanding. Um, and then the final category I wanted to talk about is um, the way that China is making a large scale attempt to influence politics in Europe um, through increasingly assertive diplomatic efforts. Um, Martin talked about the United Front, but another example is 
uh, so-called Chinese Friendship Group. That's an unofficial organization in the European Parliament with strong ties to the Chinese government. Uh, it diverges from normal public diplomacy because it's a private group um, and it has been seen to effectively function as a proxy for Communist Party domestic and external propaganda. Um, and many members of the European Parliament were unaware of its ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I know I'm getting short on time, so I wanted to conclude just by saying that the transatlantic institutions and governments need to be clear-eyed and specific about the goals of Chinese government influence. We need to better understand how, where, and why it poses an existential threat to our democratic world order um, and realize that China is working in many spheres. And you know, the if we we've looked at them in, in separate uh, discrete veins, but we need to see how that web of influence is um, knitting together um, and how it is starting to pervert the institution's rules and norms um, and trying to redirect it toward the China model. Um, and, you know, I have to say this is, you know, uh, Martin described how, you know, the West has been weakened and China emboldened. I, you know, this is in large part because the United States has abdicated its leadership role um, in democratically based international institutions and China has stepped into this absence um, and it has been effective at dividing uh, Western unity. So I hope, I'll end on a positive note, I hope that starting in 2021, we will have a return to values-based leadership with a new US administration, I'm betraying my own bias, but, and uh, that we'll have, and that a unified transatlantic approach is again possible. Um, Europe and the United States need to push back against China's violations of international norms with strength and consequences. With democracy as a system in direct conflict with the China model, uh, the transatlantic community must pursue a more competitive approach to blunting China's efforts to advance its ambitions. Otherwise, we risk encouraging Beijing to change the status quo and we're not protecting our interests and values. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, <clears throat> we have here the demonstration of the importance of the and the cause of um, human rights and uh, the cause of multilateralism and of uh, democratic democratic reflection. Uh, and uh, I agree. I fully agree with you. Uh, we must uh, have a clear a clear. Uh, information and conscience about uh, um, the, the situation. Uh, that the structural uh, element uh, uh, referred by Martin. Uh, but uh, uh, I fully agree of you and uh, uh, with you. And uh, I think it's not uh, easy, but uh, uh, we need uh, to have um, clear, a clear priority concerning human rights, concerning uh, uh, the multi multilateralism, and also uh, the ins democratic institutions, and uh, um, that's why initiatives as uh, as the real political forum is uh, uh, are very very important. Thank you, thank you very much, Susan, and I'm going to to uh, give the floor to uh, Chiao Qiang. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, this is my first time to this uh, uh, forum uh, um, at a special time, in a special format, but I'm really uh, honored. A little bit of about myself background. I grew up in China, born in China, uh, came to United States when I uh, was graduate school at middle 90, uh, 80s, 1986, to United States to study uh, physics. Um, I was, remember, I remember Cultural Revolution because that time I was grew up when I was six, six, seven, eight, you know, my teenagers. I, I was also born in a generation of Chinese Communist Party's elite family. My grandparents' generation was involved in the, in the, in the, in with Mao, with Zhou Enlai, with Deng Xiaoping, that uh, the first generation of Chinese Communist revolutionaries who win the uh, 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 civil war and took the power of China and 
you know, it's the same Communist Party still running China today. Um, but I also belong to the generation of in the 80s, grew up in China with the opening to the world after the tragedy and disaster of Cultural Revolution, have a very fresh eyes to the world, hoping China to be open, to China to be free. And uh, uh, like the generation who's standing in Tiananmen Square in 1989 demanding democracy, uh, I that time I was already studying in the United States, but I went back to China, became part of the movement ever since. But then I became exiled in the United States, working on human rights, democracy, and now looking at internet freedom uh, and, and, and other issues on China. The last 30 years, 30 some years, China went through another transformation, right? From uh, uh, a, a actually essentially a very backward economic uh, 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 status of country now became almost it's the second economy of the world and it become also it's, it's on its way becoming the largest economy of the world becoming an economic superpower and and, and the threatening uh, 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 in, in, the, in the global order in many ways that we're talking about. Uh, this 30 years I have been living outside of China but giving a close observation uh, because what I do, uh, particularly through the lens of human rights and democracy. Um, let me, there's many things I would like to use this uh, uh, chance to, to discuss with everyone, but I'm trying to uh, uh, be succinct. So I'm trying to throw a few points. One, Martin already said, uh, the West uh, to some degree misread China or Chinese Communist Party. Well, let's say from uh, even a more historical uh, background, uh, the so-called the West and the China has been interact since what, 18th centuries and 19th centuries. Uh, this has been a, a uneven, right? West came in China as a developed uh, industrial nation countries. Uh, it's a military power, it's economic power, and China was a thousands of years of civilization, but being weakened, uh, being confronted in the fact that it was so weak that economically, militarily, and politically could not really respond to this new global uh, opening challenges. This is a since 19th century or even 18th century. But look closely to, and, and I, what I want to say is China's response to this modern change, industrial change, until now has essentially taken on two routes. One, the people saying that we need to be westernized. We need to be just becoming the West, to take all their, what they learn from why they're stronger than us. Therefore, we can be as strong as them or even back to stronger again. This cut. And even Chinese Communist Party led that route because Chinese Communist Party took the ideology from the West, right? Marxism, Leninism. I think that would take China transform and into a, a, a strong nation. Yeah. Uh, of course, the Marxism did, is a universalism. It didn't have this nationalistic part of the element, but Chinese Communist Party always did. Um, that also, but even a deeper root in the China, China's political elite and intellectual elite responding to the West, it has been always another one called, we keep so-called China or Chinaness is essential as a body, don't change. But we learn the West from their techniques, whether their science, whether their technology, whether it's their even some of the political economic system, political skills, but make that use to support, to make this so-called China body essentially strong. What's the body? The body is a political fundamental of the system. And what is it? It's actually not too difficult to, to, to say it. It's authoritarian and sometimes based on totalitarian. What the historian called the Qin Han polity is starting from Qin dynasty, which is a, essentially a totalitarian state. Add to the legalism, and then to the Han Dynasty, they add another code of the 
Confucianism, an ideological softness to it. So it's on the on, on the surface, on the technology, on the, on the ideology side, it's always always Confucianism, the hierarchy thing. But then at the core, it's always a totalitarian authoritarian regime, very ruthless to its own people. It, essentially, what legalism is is people are enemies, and the rulers have to use a strong way to deal with it. At the same time, it coded with this Confucianism on the top is some kind of hierarchy, uh, political order, mo uh, you know, similar to parallel to the family order, using that to make the ruling easier. That essential China incense, China power's incense has never really changed. Even the Chinese Communist Party took the power using the Marxism, Leninism organization, Marxism uh, ideology, but look at what Mao did ruling China. It's still an empire ruling China as the essentially uh, uh, like thousand years ago, the dynasty. Deng doesn't make too much difference. It's, it's essentially keep the China political polity, which is that totalitarian authoritarian regime, but incorporate many new elements, which is market economy, capitalism, incorporated in the edu Western science education, incorporated with many other things, trade. And then the coming to today, Xi Jinping's era, we are still facing a same Chinese political tradition back to thousand years ago, except some, some uh, interruption between that uh, China falling from different states. Otherwise, it's a centralia, it's some kind of a universalism of world order ruler sitting on the top and ruling people as the kind of rule by law, not rule of law, rule by law. Now, this political order has been always there and all the things to in, uh, learn from the West are being used to supporting this order. And somehow the West has started to want to engage with China, wants to incorporate China, expecting China to be converged and also trying to hedge the, the, the risks of if China doesn't converge. Now we are looking at a new situation, which is actually it's an old issue, which is does China really completely change its nature of the political entity? Yeah. And becoming more sort of be a, a, a consistent part uh, uh, of the, 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 the world the rule law based system or China continue to be that a, uh, a, a politically a authoritarian, even totalitarian state. I'll, 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 I'll talk about that. Um, but with a much stronger and a, in China in a much more globalized world. Let me throw, this is sort of historical look of it. Let me throw a couple of things that, that also a bigger question. We all enjoyed globalization and the communication technology revolution in the past few decades. That's something we can look at our life, our society, everything, all the positive things and development coming from it. But also now we see certain disruptions, uh, uh, things also uh, backlashes against those two fundamental force, technology and globalization. But have we ever asked at the West, looking at China, that globalization and a technology revolution also strengthening a Chinese Communist Party ruling authoritarian ruling of China. We made a wrong assumption, including myself, right? Globalization is increasing trade, the trade will opening up China, China becoming more like the rest of the world, China becoming less and less authoritarian and becoming more and more like the other part of the world. Well, at this point, that assumption looks very problematic. We also assume, particularly myself, that get into the technology revolution, internet, uh, 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 communication revolution, China, internet bring the information into China, and then the people have voices, people can coordinate their actions. No dictatorship, we thought, can survive in the age of information and, and internet. Well, that was half true for, few, for, for some 10 years or so, Seems like that trend happening in many parts of the world, including in China, despite of the effort of censorship. But history has turned. 
that when the Chinese Communist Party was very nervous sitting on this new technology and trying to control it, and kind of unsuccessfully until 2010, 2012, Xi Jinping came in with much stronger power trying to control the internet. The technology development itself take a turn, which is the new generation of technology, big data, artificial intelligence, cloud computing. Uh, all these are in favor of centralization of information processing, in favor of large corporation, and in the case of China, in favor of the state. It's asymmetrical because internet users doesn't have those so much uh, uh, use of those data and, and those new technology to process the data, generating knowledge about the users. But state does, corporation does. But in China, you can't separate between the state and the corporations. The large Chinese corporation produces all the face, facial recognition cameras for every place. The, the data in storage in the place the state can have access anytime, any when they need it or when they have technology to need it. And in Ch Chinese government to see the data is a new oil is a strategic asset of the state. The Chinese Communist Party has to control it. Just like the Chinese Communist Party has to control the media, has to control the railway, has to control the transportation, et cetera. Now, this new generation of technology provide a new possibility and new tools that the Chinese Communist Party can much more effectively control the Chinese society. Right. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Let's just say China has more than 900 million smartphones now. And all these smartphones are using, let's say, WeChat. WeChat is just an example of it. WeChat is a super app, not only for your, it's a combination of Facebook, the combination of uh, 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 Twitter and uh, everything uh, else that you can use that to pay, you can use that to book your hotel, you can use that to order your food, and you can use that to uh, have all your social contacts on it, say the, say the least. But WeChat belongs to Tencent. Tencent, the so-called pri private company, is actually absolutely in the hand of Chinese state. So all this data of a personal life, private life, daily transactions, potentially, they are all in the hand of the state. When the state has this much hand, this much data of their citizens, plus we made another wrong assumption about authoritarian state of China. We think, oh, this, they, they don't have freedom of expression. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, they're not that creative. Their uh, internet industry uh, can only copy, cannot be innovative. Well, that's actually wrong. The Chinese internet uh, industry is very strong and very competitive and starting from a lot of copycats from the United States and now becoming quite innovative in implementation. The new generation of technology are not about the fundamental research breakthrough, which is deep learning. That is being done in the United States and the United States is still leading that research. But on the implementation level to building the applications of the, uh, 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 of the, the social uses, that China now, facial recognition, voice recognition, ID uh, technology, surveillance technology are leading. I know my time's running out. I'm gonna say two things and I'll stop. One is the technology now giving a Chinese Communist Party a comparative advantage. While the West, including Europe, are struggling to how to regulate those surveillance technology, China state invest and fully developing those technologies. When this gave the Chinese Communist Party a more powerful way to control its own people, but also making them a more aggressive and, and assertive internationally, not only exporting those technologies, but also emboldening it to see the global order is a different. It's, they want a global order which can fit a authoritarian, even a totalitarian China. So I want to end up a, 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 a one statement to say the nature of Chinese political system has not changed, but when it's taken advantage of a globalization and technology revolution getting stronger and stronger now becoming really powerful, we are facing a question 
that either this system in conflict, fundamentally in conflict with the rule-based order, international order and democratic order of the United States uh, and Europe and other countries that they sort of trying to build since the Second World War, or the China political system has to fundamentally change. Uh, change. That is a dilemma and a situation we are facing. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, it's clear. We have uh, a dilemma. Uh, you have uh, in your back the um, Human Rights Declaration and uh, it's very important um, to understand in practical terms the importance of the human rights and the importance of the answer, uh, a global answer to the, the uh, debt paradox. Uh, the more technology, less human rights. No, we, we must have uh, a common uh, answer concerning this question. That's why um, your perspective is very, very important because uh, we need a hope uh, world, but uh, uh, we need also uh, a common work uh, and a common engagement. Um, uh, that's why I think it's very, very important you uh, are here speaking with the Human Rights Declaration in your back and in our front. Thank you very much. You. Well, Louisa, I think we can have uh, uh, five minutes of uh, uh, some questions and Louisa, I give you the floor. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for such interesting and challenging uh, presentations. And so much so that we have a huge number of questions. Our audience has been, you know, exchanging uh, messages in writing. And for me, this is a first. I mean, uh, uh, it's extremely, uh, you know, uh, constructive and enthusiastic uh, to have so many questions, but so difficult for me to choose among them. And uh, I, uh, we only have uh, seven minutes and so my criteria uh, uh, are going to be, first of all, I'm going to choose three questions. Uh, the first one is the first question that was uh, um, uh, asked even before the panel convened. Uh, and uh, um, so this is one that I'm choosing. Another one is a question from a group of students for the master's degree. And a third one is going to be from one student, uh, an individual student. Um, and then you are going to be free to answer as long as we have time for these. But I think that these questions really are so important that they need to be asked. So the first one is from Ambassador Rika Schmerkeni, uh, who asks, do you see a growing consensus in Europe about the strategic challenges China represents and what policy should be done to strengthen and uh, 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 cooperation with the US in the emerging great power competition. So this is really a very complex question uh, uh, and here it is. Then the second one uh, is, um, sorry. do you think there is room for Western democracies, namely the US and the EU to work all together in order to circumvent the challenges posed by China. And then a question from one student, a very direct one from Rui Gomes from Universidade de Berinterior. How should, this is very direct, how should the free world organize in face of the Chinese authoritarian project? So these are the three questions that I leave you with to answer uh, uh, as best you can, if you can. Who would like to take the floor? I think we can begin by Martin. Okay, Martin, yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. These are all excellent questions. And uh, I guess we could probably spend uh, weeks uh, discussing them, maybe lifetimes. So just very briefly, I'll try to uh, combine them all together and uh, and uh, maybe offer just a few thoughts. Uh, in terms of uh, consensus in Europe, I, I see both 
tendencies at the same time. So there's there is a growing consensus in some parts of Europe. There's a there's certainly a growing understanding of what the issue is. That is always the best basis of uh, you know for a future consensus. But I also see the lack of consensus and uh, exactly the opposite tendencies. And I've already mentioned some of them, like uh, you know like the like like uh, the, these attempts from from the from the PRC side to essentially divide Europe, which again is just a just a variation on the United Front tactic, you know, the the, the classic triangular game when you um, you unite yourself with uh, one part of the what is perceived as enemy against the other part, basically dividing the other camp. So in 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 the case of Europe, the most probably the most visible part of that is the uh, is the 16 plus one or 17 plus one initiative, but there are many more such examples. So in short, I see both. I see both, uh, 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 you know, an, an emerging consensus, and I also see uh, tendencies that are exactly opposite to it. Uh, now, the, uh, the the cooperation with the United between the United States and Europe that is of course essential, and that is another triangular triangle, another triangular game by the CCP. You know, trying to, uh, uh, in the current uh, uh, situation, to use uh, Europe essentially against uh, the United States. Uh, the, the, the the way the question was was uh, phrased was quite interesting because it uh, it mentioned the the great power competition, and I think, in terms of terminology, this is actually this shows where some of the problems are because I much prefer to great power competition, which is a term used in the United States and some of the official uh, government docu documents in the United States. I much prefer the, the, the European, the European, uh, sorry, am I, am I over time? Okay, sorry, I'll, I'll end up. I'll, yeah, I'll end <laughs> Susan, Thank you. Susan, please. Susan, um, those are big questions and that's, um, you know, I uh, managed the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group and um, last year published um, the Democracy Playbook with Brookings that looked at um, how to counter authoritarianism and you know, at every step of the way, what every actor within um, democratic society do and at the international level. Um, so I encourage people to take a look at that. It's essentially our attempt to modernize the Gene Sharp um, Type of approach, but also apply it to the current, you know, authoritarian challenge. Um, on the first question, I, I talked a little bit about how I think, you know, the in the months to come, it will really be determinative on on that front. Um, you know, we can't the the fact that the United States has basically withdrawn from being a constructive player on the world stage um, and is not working in concert with Europe. Um, that has had an enormous impact and has enabled China to really sure. uh, innovate on its tactics. Um, so I think that in order for us to organize in the face of um, China's authoritarianism and circumvent the challenge, so combining the last two questions, um, one, um, the you know the European Union needs to have unity within its own house. You know Serbia. Um, and others have been going in their own direction, yeah. hungry. Um, and the US needs to be clear that it's going to hold China accountable. Um, and then I suggested, you know, some new areas where, um, such as on technology and the digital orientation, where there's probably a need to create something new beyond what exists and is possible within NATO, the United Nations, um, EU OSCE that there should thank, thank you very much thank you, thank you. and uh, Chiao Kiang, uh, please okay the first question growing consensus uh, I, I I don't think I can say something but secondly second question do I think the room for Western democracy to work together absolutely and it's a must the third one how should we uh, uh, sort of organize uh, the, in the West to to counter China's global advance of the authoritarianism. How? First of all, we have to recognize the truth. The Chinese authoritarian regime does have some comparative advantage 
let's think about how they effectively control the coronavirus compared with many other Western societies. Okay, because of this, the, 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 the government very effectively controls the society for one thing, that's the advantage. And my last point is don't underestimate the danger of China's rising nationalism. The Xi Jinping's China dream is called individualism, individual happiness depend on state greatness. If anybody in the West remember that, that's the fascism fundamental. So don't underestimate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Luisa, you can have the last word. Well, my last word is a word of thanks uh, to you whom I'm seeing uh, on the screen and to you all who have been with us without being present physically, uh, but being so attentive and asking these incredibly interesting questions. My only uh, sorrow uh, after this meeting is not being able to continue and to continue discussing and giving really the floor to our audience as well. Uh, I had a number of questions directly to uh, uh, one of the speakers, uh, to each one of you, uh, but I had to choose and I think that you were all brilliant and I hope that uh, uh, the audience uh, was also very satisfied as well. We must continue this meeting at yeah. another time. Thank you so much. And Thank we you, are Lisa. over time. I think that we, Michelle, shall we uh, leave the floor, the screen? Yes, please.